The Philistine army had gathered for war against Israel. The two armies faced each other, camped for battle on opposite sides of a steep valley. The Philistines had a champion called Goliath, who was over nine feet tall and who wore full, seemingly impenetrable armor and carried a huge pointed spear. For 40 days, Goliath came out mocking and challenging the Israelites to fight. Saul, the king of Israel, and his whole army cowered in dismay and terror. One day, the young David was sent to the battle lines by his father to bring provisions for and bring back news of his brothers who were in the Israelite army. While there, David heard Goliath shouting his daily defiance, saw the Israelites fleeing in fear, and something stirred within him. He responded, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? Saul heard about this, and so David was brought before him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from youth. But David was undeterred and told Saul how he had killed wild animals while protecting his father's sheep. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul agreed and dressed David in his armour. But David took off Saul's armour and weapons because he was not used to them. So, dressed in his simple tunic, carrying his shepherd's staff, sling, and a pouch full of stones, David approached the fully armed Goliath. The giant cursed at him, hurling threats and insults. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As Goliath moved in for the kill, David reached into his bag and slung one of his stones at Goliath's head. Finding a hole in the armour, the stone sank into the giant's forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. David then took Goliath's sword, killed him, and then cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. The Israelites pursued, chasing and killing them and plundering their camp. Thus David overcame the giant in the name of the Lord. Thank you. Thanks for the welcome. Welcome to part three of this series on faith, uh, which is really about us stepping into 2020 with confidence, knowing that God is with us. Amen. And God is good. And he has so many blessings for us in this uh, new year. And uh, I love a little quote by an old Puritan, John Bunyan, uh, author of Pilgrim's Progress. And he uh, used to say that God has made so many promises that a Christian can't take a step forwards without treading on one. And I love that idea that the future, the 2020, is littered with the promises of God and faith is about stepping in confidently to what God has for us. There are so many blessings, but I also would imagine there'll be some battles in 2020. You may already be very acutely aware of the, the challenges, the Goliaths, the giants, the, the bullies, the opposition that feels in the way of the things that God wants to do in your life. So 
This is a message based on the story of David and Goliath that's about faith stepping forwards with confidence in the, in the face of the battles to take the blessings that God has for us. And isn't it an amazing story, David and Goliath? We just had it read back to us. I said, isn't it an amazing story, David and Goliath? I feel so privileged to preach on it. I mean, it's just, it's like, I feel like the cat that's got the cream, to be honest. It's a beautiful story and it's a lovely underdog story, isn't it? It still actually gets... Um, even though it's an ancient story, it still has some cultural capital today. There's actually a really good TED talk about David and Goliath, you might be interested. But also, you, you may have realised that when there's a sporting clash, um, there's particularly FA Cup rounds, there's like this David and... People speak, oh, it's like David versus Goliath. You know, you've got this incredibly good team that's almost impossible to beat, like Liverpool at the moment. And then this underdog, this really inferior team that's not got a chance, like Man City at the moment. And... Uh, <laughs> And, <laughs> and it's like this David and Goliath kind of idea um, about, uh, and so we're still using it today, but I want to use it for our lives, not just for sporting spectacles, but for 2020. How can we have the kind of faith that David had that even though we're the underdogs, even though life has challenges that seem too big for us, we can step forward with a confidence that in faith we can take down some giants. Amen. Well, there's a number of principles in the story of David, and there's a number of angles, ways of approaching the story. I actually want to give two different approaches that we'll reconcile together. But the first principle to overcoming the giants is to know that we can't overcome the giants, right? The first angle on the story of David and Goliath is to recognize we are not David in the story. I'll explain what I mean in a moment. But the first thing that we've got to get clear is on our own, if you like, by nature. We'll talk in a moment about what we can do by faith. But by nature, we cannot take down the giants. I mean, just look at yourselves. You're not, you're not in any fit state to take down giants right now. You just about made it to church on Sunday morning, right? The, the, the challenges of life are far too big for us. No, no, we're much more like the Israelite army. Did you hear in the story? They, they're stuck. They're stuck in a context where they can't move forwards. The Philistines have surrounded them. Goliath keeps coming out, I don't know if you notice, twice a day, morning and evening, he taunts Israel and there's nothing they can do. He represents all the challenges of life that can feel utterly overwhelming and we feel stuck in the face of it with a lot of fear. I mean, that might be life for you right now. You may be facing challenges that feel utterly overwhelming and there's a lot of fear. We identify them with the Israelite army and yet... Whilst we are stuck like they were stuck, suddenly in the story there's the, the intervention hero that turns up. Sent by his father, David arrives on the scene and because someone came from somewhere else into the story, everything changes. David then, in the Bible, is not just a figure in the Old Testament. David becomes a symbol or a type of ultimately Jesus the Messiah. I mean, if you notice some of the parallels here, where was David born? Bethlehem. Does that ring any bells? Jesus, born in Bethlehem. Just as David went down to face Goliath, sent by his father to win a battle that we could not win, God the Father sent his son into our challenges to take on the Goliaths we could not defeat. Sin and death and hell. And just as David went down into the valley and took on Goliath, so Jesus Christ went down into mortal combat with sin and death and hell itself. And in his resurrection, as David cut off the head of Goliath and brought it up, to show everyone that he had won the decisive battle. So in the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus Christ returns from death in order to demonstrate to humanity that he has bought us decisive victory. Now this is Christianity, folks, right? We are not the hero of our own story, amen? Jesus is the hero of the story. He is David's greatest son. He is the son of David, as he'll often be referred to in the Gospels. He is the one who brings the intervention that we all so desperately need. But then this is how Christianity works, you see, because when, before David comes on the scene, all of the army are stuck in fear. When David takes down Goliath, suddenly that same army are mobilized with faith. They surge forward and they start enjoying the victory that David won. That is Christianity. Jesus Christ has won the decisive victory. He's the hero. But because of the victory that he's won, we can now be the mobilized people of God to surge forwards in faith and apply the victory of Jesus. Think of it in those terms and imagine our moment then in the story, almost a bit like 
to use the Second World War analogy, on the 6th of June, 1944, it was D-Day, the decisive moment of victory ultimately in the Second World War when the Allied forces landed on the Normandy beaches under great, through great sacrifice, that moment in many ways secured the outcome of the war. But that was the 6th of June, 1944. It wasn't until the 9th of May, 1945, that we had VE Day, the actual final declaration that the war was over, victory in Europe. And in between that time, the decisive victory had been won, D-Day, but there was still some fighting to do until the ultimate victory had been achieved. And I think that's a lovely picture of where we find ourselves in the Christian story. Jesus Christ has won the decisive victory. His resurrection is D-Day. <laughs> because he sacrificed his own life on the cross and defeated death, we now know the outcome of the war, <laughs> except that we still have some fighting to do to apply the victory Jesus has already won. Because he won, we can now win by faith. Amen? I love, if you read the story on, I love this little detail that I'd missed before, but it turns out that Goliath had a brother. <laughs> and this brother presumably was also a giant, uh, as you read about it in later in 2 Samuel. But this unknown figure called Elkanah, he turns up, an Israelite, and he takes down Goliath's brother. I love the fact that once David had defeated Goliath, all, all the rest of his relatives are taken down by just ordinary people. In other words, when Jesus gives us the decisive victory, we who otherwise are unknown ordinary people, now we can win great victories by faith. So on the one hand, we say Jesus is David. He is the decisive winner in the ultimate human story. And yet because of his victory, we can now live in Christ. We can take on the authority and the role of David in the story. Now we can learn the principles of how we exercise faith to apply the victory of Jesus. So I want to speak over anyone who's stuck today. Israel was stuck until faith intervened and broke through. If you're stuck today, I want to speak with faith over you. That can finish today. You can move forwards with fresh faith and confidence into 2020 because Jesus has won the decisive victory. Now here's three principles then that apply the victory of Jesus through the story of David and Goliath. And the first is this, faith won't tolerate the giants. The first thing about faith that breaks through is that it won't tolerate the giants. Or we could put it this way, this is a little heading underneath the heading, because Jesus has won the victory, faith won't put up with giants and defeat. Because Jesus is risen, there are some things in this world that need to change. That, that, that actually because he is Lord and he is living, we're not going to settle. No, no, we are a people who believe situations can change because Jesus is Lord. In other words, we have a victory that we now apply by saying we're not going to settle for the giants in the land. We're not going to just be bullied and oppressed by the challenges of life. We're not going to go under those things. We are going to go over them in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus has won the decisive victory, faith won't put up with the giants. And this is what we see with David. He turns up to a scene where God's people had got so stuck that it had become normal to experience defeat. And this is, this is a, I think this is a real challenge. Isn't it possible in life to still be genuinely part of God's people? We're still Christians, but we get so stuck, we normalize things that really shouldn't be normal. We allow things to go unchallenged that really shouldn't be the case in our lives if Jesus is Lord. And so you find in the story, we read in verse 20, that the army was going out to its battle positions shouting the war cry. And they did this for 40 days, morning and evening. So 80 times God's people turned up to the right place and said all the right things and then ran away in fear. It's extraordinary, isn't it, how you can get so stuck that you're still speaking the right things and you're still on the rotor and turning up to church, but your life is undermined by the fear. Your life is not actually expressing the confidence and victory of Jesus. Is that ringing true for anyone? It's easy to get stuck and it's subtle the way it happens and other people may not even realise it's happened because you're still outwardly doing all the right things like they were but inwardly you've lost your faith and your confidence in the Lord and life is bullying you into a place that you don't really want to live from. That was Israel until David turned up. But David turned up and he saw what was happening. He saw this, this 
this, this charade, really, of speaking out the truth, the war cry, and then running away in fear. And it's like something snapped in David, and he said, enough. <laughs> this, this, if, if we serve the living God, then this stops. This is not normal. This is not okay. <laughs> Faith redefines what's normal. Amen? Faith says, no, no, if Jesus is Lord, then normal is not living in defeat. Normal is not allowing sin to master us in secret and compromised ways. Normal is not being bullied into silence about our faith. Normal is not hiding away from the challenges of life. Normal is stepping forwards with confidence that Jesus Christ is Lord, risen from the dead, and we're not putting up with the bullies. Amen? Faith won't tolerate the giants. I remember uh, being a, 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 when I was a boy, I remember moving schools, and uh, as the new kid in the playground, the school bully quickly identified me as the new kid and came over and roughed me up a little bit. And I actually went home with a black eye uh, from this bully. And uh, my parents obviously saw this, and my mum took a very New Testament response, which was sort of, we must, we must be kind and patient and perhaps turn the other cheek. And I think my father was, was a bit more Old Testament about it all. <laughs> so he must have been reading the story of David and Goliath, I think. So he took me into his study and closed the door so, so that there was no interruptions. And he said, right, son, this is how you make a fist. <laughs> and this is how you punch. And if the bully comes tomorrow, you warn him once, you warn him twice, and then rock back and hit him as hard as you can in the solar plexus. There were no headshots allowed, I seem to remember. Anyway, the next day it panned out roughly as expected. The bully did find me again because I'd given him the day before and I did roughly as my father told me to. And uh, that was, I think, the end of the school bully. Um, or perhaps there was a new school bully, I'm not sure. <laughs> but <laughs> now, now, now I'm not actually putting that forward as parental advice, okay? Uh, please don't apply that um, in your own family context. We're certainly not, I hasten to add. But I do think, spiritually speaking, it's actually, there's a bit of a lesson there. Sometimes you just have to say enough. We're not going to be bullied by fear and by spiritual forces that would make us go quiet and just put up with it. There are some things in our lives that we shouldn't be putting up with because Jesus is risen. Amen? And putting up with it almost undermines what we say we believe that he's Lord. And so if we're going to lift up the name of Jesus, it is to say then that the bullies will not be tolerated. The giants cannot stay in the land if Jesus is Lord. Can I ask you, what is there in your life where you've got stuck tolerating things that really shouldn't be normal? They've actually become normal for you. It's a normal thing in your home or it's a normal thing in your heart or it's a normal thing that you're sort of almost giving a sense of, well, it will just probably always be like this. No, no, if Jesus Christ is Lord, it doesn't always need to be like this. Things can change because he's risen. And so we have to have a certain defiance, a David-like defiance that says we're not put enough it stops today. We're not putting up with this kind of compromise and intimidation. Jesus is Lord. Faith won't tolerate the bullies. Secondly, then, building on that, faith learns to fully rely on God. You see, you might be thinking, well, this is all very inspirational, but when you are facing Goliath, of course, you shouldn't tolerate Goliath, but how are you going to get rid of him? <laughs> and the answer is by faith. And we'll unpack what we mean by that in a moment. But the, the idea I want to land first and foremost is that faith is, well, let me put it this way. Again, a headline under the heading. Faith is a spiritual muscle. The more we exercise it, the stronger it grows. See, I think sometimes our problem with faith is that we feel so intimidated by other people. And we feel so inadequate that we say things like, well, I don't have enough faith. Well, faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. So it's not really about how much faith you've got, it's how faithful God is. And the key thing is that it doesn't matter how big or small your faith is, the key issue is not that, it's whether your faith is dormant or active. That's the real issue, not whether it's big or small. Is it dormant or is it active? And that's what I mean about faith is like a muscle, you've got to exercise it, otherwise it will atrophy and, and wither away. But if you exercise faith, it grows stronger, right? Think of faith... You know, rather than being su super spiritual about it all and all mysterious, think of faith like going to the gym, right? Of course your muscles may be small and your cardiovascular fitness too low, but if you turn up to the gym and start exercising it, it grows, right? And you become someone that you weren't by exercising what you have. So stop comparing yourself to great people of faith and feeling inadequate. Start exercising the faith that you do have with the challenges that you do face, and it will grow. Now, David does this, right? He's not a soldier. 
He's not overqualified. Far from it. He hasn't actually got experience of fighting in this kind of battle. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, he wasn't even... The only reason he went was he was the grocery boy. Did you see this? It's like he's the lunchbox monitor for the whole situation. (laughs) I think I was that at primary school. Uh, not, not, Not a great thing to put on your CV. But he's turning up just to bring the groceries to the real soldiers who are meant to be the experts... And yet he has faith, however unqualified and however much there's people who are further on than him, he refuses just to hide behind his inadequacies. And ironically, the grocery boy takes down Goliath. And there's a lesson in that, which is this. Faith is like a muscle. Exercise the faith that you do have and it will grow. Well, Saul Saul hears about David as he turns up. And this is the dialogue that we read. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man and he's been a warrior from his youth. Now listen to faith speaking. But David said, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. What faith. Here's the grocery boy turning up and saying, this is not continuing and I'll sort it out. Extraordinary, isn't it? And and can I remind you, when I say it's extraordinary, can I remind you that David, at this point, had never read the story of David and Goliath, right? It's just worth remembering that, isn't it, sometimes? Because we're so familiar with how this one goes, we almost assume he was familiar. No, no, he'd never read the story of David and Goliath because at this point he's busy writing it, right? Faith, Faith doesn't tell stories, faith writes stories. Faith doesn't just tell what other people have done in the past, faith steps up and says, well, let's do something now in the present. Let's take the past, did you notice that? David takes the things that have demonstrated God's power and faithfulness in the past. I've killed lions and bears. And he says, so because God has been faithful in the past, God is able for this giant. And it's that connection. You see what he's doing. He's drawing from the past, literally in the tenses. Did you hear it? He has rescued me. He will rescue me. That's the logic of faith that says, it's not about the size of my faith. It's the size of God's faithfulness. I've seen him do it with the lions and bears. He'll do it with the giant. So I want to encourage you, if you are a Christian and you've been a Christian for some time, I can only imagine, like David, you've got stories of faith. But the issue really is, what do you do with those stories? Do you just sit around rehearsing what you've seen God do in the past? Or do you channel those stories to summon up fresh faith to write a new story for the future? You see, actually, one of the ways we get stuck is because, precisely because we've taken down some lions and bears, instead of going for the giant, we sit around telling stories about lions and bears. But the issue with our faith, if it's a muscle, is this. Not how fit you've been in the past, but how fit is your faith today? How active is your faith today? Are you prepared to take the stories of the past and write a new chapter with faith in the future. This is what David's doing. He's summoning up. He's refusing to get stuck telling old stories and he's determined that he will take those stories and summon up fresh faith to write a new one. Now that's true, a great challenge if we've been Christians for a while, but maybe you've not been a Christian for very long and your challenge is more, well, I don't feel adequate. You know, these, all these other people seem so experienced. Listen, you need to fight your bears and lions and then you'll be ready for your Goliath. And maybe that's the thing to focus on. You may feel like your battles are very small compared to other people. You know, I'm still, other people are talking about taking down giants and I'm still trying to learn how to pray out loud, which feels so incredibly threatening or how to tell my friends at work that I'm even a Christian in the first place or how to invite someone to Alpha. Listen, fight those small battles, however unseen and small they may seem, and your muscles will grow. One day you'll take down Goliath if you attend to the lions and bears right now. Take on the challenges in front of you. Don't hide behind inadequacy. Step forwards, just as the grocery boy did, with the faith that he had and took on the giant in Jesus' name. You know, this is what David ultimately says, verse 37. This is his confidence, right? Where do you get the kind of confidence to speak forth as David does with such faith? He says this, verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the lion, he will rescue me from this Philistine. I've never um, fought lions, as I'm sure most of us haven't either, and I've never fought 
Goliath either. But I have, um, I did spend actually a bit of time in the in Kenya quite recently, and there I uh, spent a bit of time with a Maasai warrior tribe. You can actually see a picture here of me uh, trying to join the tribe. You have to jump, uh, and it's about how high you jump as to whether you enter the tribe. So there I am. Yeah, I think you can see the look of terror on their faces. Is that right? Um, at this new this new tribe that's in town, the Olaton tribe. Anyway. Um, I, I spent a bit of time with these warriors, and, I, and they, they live in this, uh, in this village that they built in the bush, and basically they do face lion attacks quite regularly, and I was quite intrigued by this. In fact, one of them showed us, as you can see, how to throw a spear um, at a lion if, if under attack. Fortunately, it was just a tree that the spear hit, but the point was, these were real warriors facing real lions, and I was intrigued about how you get the confidence to do that, and they said two things which struck me. Number one... They said that the the very robes that they wear, they all wear these red robes, which symbolizes that it's their Maasai identity, and the lion know this. I found this extraordinary. In fact, you can see it on Google, but the lion are actually, they respect the Maasai Maasai, uh, robes. And so they can walk through lion territory, and the lion keep away from them because they have an authority in their identity. That's the first thing. The second thing, more amusing, was that as the guy threw his spear, something dropped out of his pocket uh, underneath the robe. And I, being very helpful, I said, I think you've dropped something there. It turned out to be his mobile phone, <laughs> <laughs> which I found highly amusing. There is an authentic Maasai warrior with an iPhone. And he, did, and he actually said to me, he said, oh, yeah, he said, uh, being a bit honest after this sheepish, he said, oh, yeah, he said, I'd never go out in the bush without one of these. Because <laughs> if you get in trouble, you've got to be able to call for help, right? I thought, well, that's basically how you have confidence in lion country. Number one, you know who you are. You have an authority. And number two, you know who you can call on. (laughs) You have help. And that's exactly how we face the challenges of life in 2020. We need to know who we are. We are clothed with the authority of Jesus Christ. And the forces of darkness in this world, they will move away from those who have the authority of Jesus. And we call on the name of Jesus. Amen? When we lift up the name of Jesus, we're bringing his authority to bear on our circumstances. There is power in the name of Jesus. Now, all of that, the confidence to fully rely on God, to be clothed in his authority and to call on the name of Jesus, all of this brings us to the actual moment of the showdown and our third lesson from faith today. Faith, David kind of faith, faith speaks up and steps out. And the heading underneath the heading for this point is simply this. Faith is a verb expressed in words and actions that apply the victory of Jesus. See, too often we reduce faith to the idea that we believe certain truths. But can I remind you, all of the army of Israel believed certain truths. They were going out twice a day speaking out certain truths, but they weren't actually applying the truths they believed in. True faith is a verb. It speaks and acts out of what we believe with confidence. And firstly, we hear David speaking to Goliath. Now he's actually left the cover of safety, and he's before the giant. And the first thing is not that he takes the giant down physically, but if you like, he takes the giant down verbally. Listen to what David says. This is faith speaking now. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. What faith. I mean, to speak to a a tank of a guy and say, today, I've already seen you lying on your back. (laughs) It's over. He, He actually declares that it's over before it's over. That's faith. Faith is the ability, even such confidence in God, that you can even imagine a future that's changed and declare it before it's happened. It's a remarkable thing David does, but this is actually what Hebrews says. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and an assurance about what we do not yet see. Faith can see things that you can't yet see. Faith can imagine scenarios that don't yet exist and calls them into being with a confidence that lifts up the name of Jesus over the giant and imagines him already defeated. Now that kind of faith 
is a militant kind of faith. It's the kind of faith that actually some of us need to summon up because when we face life's challenges, when the giants come along and they are in front of us, we can so easily collapse into fear and discouragement that mean we go under rather than going over. But there's an action that of faith. This, this is why faith is a muscle. It's got to do something. It's a verb. You've got to act on it. There's times where when we face those challenges, we've got to act and speak out our faith in declaring the name of Jesus. I find this for myself. When I'm facing fresh challenges or when I'm wanting to see a breakthrough that's not obvious or easy, you've got to kind of get your, got to get your faith up. You know what I mean by that? You've got to lift up the name of Jesus over this challenge and start to bring your faith to the problem or bring your faith to the opportunity. I have a little walk that I do and actually being part of Kingsgate has helped me here just to grow in a, a faith that's got more, a bit more militant, a bit more confident to say, actually, I'm not taking this <laughs> and to start to speak the confidence of the victory of Jesus over the problem rather than going under it. David is going over the head of Goliath here and declaring the name of the living God in his face. Some of us with challenges that we're facing, it's time to get back on the front foot and exercise some faith and confidence in the face of those challenges. Amen? Or as the song puts it, it's time to raise a hallelujah in the presence of our enemies. Not to go silent, but sing louder and declare more clearly your confidence in spite of the Goliaths and your confidence that because Jesus is Lord, situations can change. Now, having spoken it out, finally we get to the moment where David acts it out. He actually does something. And I just want to make the point here that it's interesting how long the story plays out with actions of faith that are verbal before there's a physical act. I think that's important. Spiritual warfare and engaging with these kinds of challenges requires considerable amounts of declaration and prayer and intercession. And then the final moment is surprisingly quick. This is what we read. Uh, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet Goliath, reaching into his bag, taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. He fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. God could have ordained it that David only had to speak words and Goliath fell. But actually, David not only spoke it, he also had to do it. <laughs> he actually had to take action. And I want to say for some of us, the most important thing we can do if we're a bit stuck is to actually do things that step into a posture of faith. Faith is a muscle. Faith is a verb. There are things we need to do to get unstuck by stepping forwards in faith. So it's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus. It's another thing to say, and I'm going to get baptized. You see the difference? One is a declaration of what I believe. The other is a verb of what I'm going to do because of what I believe. It's one thing to say, I believe that God can heal people. It's another thing to pray for those who are sick. You see the difference? One can believe a truth. The other treads on that truth and does something with it. It's one thing to say, I believe in the importance of mission and people knowing about Jesus. It's another thing to invite someone to Alpha or to share your faith with a colleague. You see the difference? It's one thing to say, I believe the church is really important. It's another thing to say, and I'm going to take up responsibility by faith. We have to tread on the things that we believe and actually step forwards with confidence. And that's how we become unstuck. Faith is a verb. Faith is a muscle. We've got to do it. Amen. Amen. In the 19th century, there was a famous tightrope um, acrobat called Blondin, a Frenchman, and he used to perform extraordinary feats. And one of them in 1859 was that they strung up a tightrope over Niagara Falls. And here you can see Blondin with a balancing pole crossing this extraordinary distance of tightrope. And then having done it with a, a balancing pole, he actually went back and uh, in true French style, he actually ate an omelette uh, halfway across the, uh, the, 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 the gorge. And then he came back the next time with a wheelbarrow, pushing a wheelbarrow across with a sack of potatoes in. And the crowds loved it. They thought it was fantastic. What a spectacle. And they could see how brilliant and skillful and reliable he was. And as Blondin arrived on the other side, he then turned to the crowd and he said, building up the, the momentum, he said, now, do you believe that I could actually take a real person across in this wheelbarrow? 
And based on the evidence of what they've seen, they all said, absolutely, yes, you could. At which point Blondin said, well, to one particular gentleman, well, then hop in. (laughs) And at that point, (laughs) he retreated, as did everybody else in the crowd, because suddenly they were being asked to go from, do you believe it in theory, to will you get in the wheelbarrow? And today we are being challenged by the Lord, not just to believe it in theory, like the rest of the Israelite army, but to get in that wheelbarrow and step out in faith like David. Giants fall when God's people say, Lord, I trust you and I'm going to actually apply the victory of Jesus to my challenges in his name. Amen.